Before I jump into the sermon, I want to talk to you, you men, just for a minute, uh, just kind of reinforce what David um, talked about earlier about the power lunch that's coming on October the 10th. The reason we're trying to do this is many of you probably work with some men that may be unchurched, um, may not know the Lord, uh, but we want you to use this as an opportunity to invite them once a month to come uh, to lunch with you. Hey, that means you're going to have to buy them lunch, okay? So come off $10, buy them lunch, invite them to come here. And uh, again, we, we just want to try to reach men in our community. And again, we believe that the stronger our families are, the stronger our churches will be, the stronger our community will be. And so just encourage you to do that. And, and while I'm speaking on family, not to redo what you did, David, but I do want to speak about our Grace-Based Parenting Conference. Uh, we have been blessed. Somebody's given some money to help kind of offset some of the costs. So let me, let, me, let me just talk to you families. Please make every effort you can to be here on that Saturday from 9 o'clock to 1 o'clock, uh, just half a day. Uh, just make sure you're here. It's going to be a great opportunity to enable you, uh, to help train you, to take some things that you can put in your pocket and, and pull out during the week whenever there's something going on with your children. Again, to, to just lead them in, in the Lord. And so just encourage you to do that. Again, just two great opportunities coming up that we can uh, encourage you and enable you uh, in your walk with Christ. Well, this morning we are continuing with our Bible study. We've been looking at the seven churches in Revelation, and we come this morning to the church at Thyatira. And in many ways, it's, it's almost the opposite of the church at Ephesus. You remember the church at Ephesus had left its first love. But one of the things we're going to see in the church at Thyatira is that that God commends them about their love. Also, we're going to see it's a very faithful church, a serving church, a persevering church, a, a church that, that is maturing, and, and a lot of great things that when we look at it, I believe we can see in our congregation. But then there comes the, the warning, as every letter has, has given up to this point, there's this warning at that there was just a cesspool of immorality, sexual immorality uh, being the major indictment against the church. And so as we begin to, to wrap our mind about the church at, at Thyatira, just understand that, that it is a corrupted church. But again, there are many good things that happen there. Just a little bit about the city of Thyatira, just kind of give you a background. Uh, if you were going down to Pergamum, you'd have to travel through this valley that Thyatira was located in. A very small city. Matter of fact, the longest letter to the seven churches is to this church, and yet it was the smallest of all the churches. And as, as the Lord Jesus writes this letter to this small community, he understood a few things about that small community. It was actually a textile town, similar to Lancaster, South Carolina. Their greatest trade uh, in this letter, when this letter was written, was fabrics. Matter of fact, in Acts chapter 16, we are introduced to a lady by the name of Lydia who came from Thyatira. In verse 14 of Acts 16, the Bible says a certain woman named Lydia... From the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening to the Lord, open, and the Lord opened her heart, and she responded to the things that Paul had said. Now, if you notice, she, was a, she sold purple fabrics. There was two things that were unique about Thyatira. Number one, there was a, a, a plant that was called a matter root that they would extract purple dyes from in order to dye their fabrics. There was also a seashell fish uh, called the murex that they would take and they would actually cut the throat of that murex to extract purple dyes, only unique to that region. And because there, there, there was not a lot of matter root in that region and because of the limited amount of the dye you could get out of the seashell fish, these fabrics were very expensive. Very expensive. And, and whenever we read about Lydia going and selling in Philippi, when you look in Acts 16, that's where Paul was preaching. She 
and her household came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And most scholars believe that Lydia and her family went back to Thyatira, and that was probably the beginning of the first church there in Thyatira. So when we think about all that goes on there, matter of fact, the, the city still exists. There's about 25,000 people that live in the city, and it still is involved in textiles. They actually weave uh, oriental rugs there in Thyatira. And as we begin to look, and again, we're in Revelation chapter 2. I'm going to begin reading in verse number 18. And we see God's word say, And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, The Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet are like burnished bronze, says this, I know your deeds and of your love, and faith, and service, and perseverance, and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, And she does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds. And I will kill her children with pestilence. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold to this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them. I place no burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have hold fast until I come. He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he shall rule with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces. As I also have received authority from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. As in every letter that we've read up to this point, there's always a description of the Lord. There's always this this statement kind of defining who he is for what is being addressed in the church. And as we look at this description It's actually three-pronged, that he is the Son of God, that he is all-seeing, and he is the God who judges. Whenever we begin to look at this this phrase, we see the Son of God is the only time it's used in the book of Revelation. Why would the Lord describe himself as the Son of God? But I believe one of the reasons is that he's making a contrast between this wicked woman called Jezebel with who he is. Jezebel who is trying to to draw people away from him and yet here he is the son of God and he is the authority over the church. I believe in this description that Jesus gives himself as he is saying no matter who comes into the church regardless if this woman Jezebel or someone else Please know that I have authority over the church and over all of creation. And therefore, when he defines his authority as the Son of God, he uses the next phrase where he says that I have eyes like a flame of fire. These eyes represent his all-encompassing knowledge. This is where we would say he is omniscient. There's nothing that you or I can hide from the Lord. He knows everything about you. He knows what you're thinking right now. He knows your actions from the past week. He he knows everything about you. And what this verse says is those penetrating eyes of fire are looking right to your very heart right now. He knows everything. Has it ever occurred to you that nothing ever occurs to God? He knows everything. He, he, and all of a sudden, he never just sits there one day and says, Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, I just thought about this. Oh, I didn't know that about Brian. No, he knows everything about me. He knows everything about you. I love what Joseph Seiss writes about this description. He says, There is nothing more piercing than flaming fire. 
Everything yields and melts before it. It penetrates all things. It consumes every opposition. Sweeps down all obstructions. It presses its way with invincible power. And of this sort are the eyes of Jesus. They look through everything. They pierce through all masks and coverings. They search the remotest recesses. They behold the most hidden things of the soul. And there is no escape from them. I stated this last week. And the truth is God knows everything about me. He knows everything I try to hide from him. He knows every every thought that I've had, good or bad, he knows it all. And because he knows it all, he's able to look. And and then all of a sudden we see this description of, of his feet are like burnished bronze. Anytime you see the word feet or even the word bronze, it speaks of God's omnipotence it speaks of his power God is a powerful God and he is a God who's able to judge how is he able to judge because he knows all he is all powerful and he has authority and so as he looks at our lives he's able to judge the very intentions of our heart matter of fact when you look in the Old Testament God would judge Israel over and over and over he knew who they were and and, and there was a time in 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 Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 23 where God saw the intentions of their heart. They were trying to pray to God but God put a lid over their prayers because this is what that passage said. The heaven which is over your head shall be bronze. That means that he wasn't going to hear their prayers. He wasn't going to hear their prayers because they were living in open rebellion before him. The Bible says something about us men that, that God won't allow our prayers to to rise above the ceiling if if we're not in in the right fellowship with the Lord if there's sin in our life we're in rebellion and so here we have this picture of this 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 God who knows what is right he knows what is wrong and he's going to judge us now even for us as believers in 2nd Corinthians chapter 5 verses 6 and 11 2nd Corinthians 5 6 through 11 every one of us even as believers are going to stand before the judgment of God Not for our salvation, because if you've placed your trust in Christ, you've already been justified. You've been found not guilty. So you are a child of God. But it is clear in that passage that we will stand before God and we will give an account for what we have done. Those deeds that we've done as we live on this earth. I don't know about you, but that causes even now a a kind of a cold chill to go up my spine to think that one day I'm going to stand before God and and all of some of those thoughts I've had, some of my actions, the sin that's in my life and and things that have been done in the past that I'm going to have to stand before God one day and he's going to look and he's going to say good, bad. All of those things. And, and, And so here we have the Lord Jesus coming and this is the description he gives before he goes into to anything else about who he is but look what it says in verse 19 the Lord knew their deeds he has some great things to say about this church one of the first things he says is is that he knew of their love we say around here that we're a place of lasting relationships where we love God and we love people and we live the mission. See, one of the defining marks of a Christian is one who is filled with love. And it's about a relationship with the Lord that we love the Lord with everything that is within us. Matter of fact, Jesus was pressed on that issue when he asked what the greatest commandment was. He said that you should love the Lord your God. With everything that's within you, you love God. And he said the second is likened to the first, that you should love your neighbor as you love yourself. He said you got to love other people. He said the whole law hangs on these two things, that we love God and we love people. And so I love what the Apostle Paul does in 1 Corinthians 13. He gives us a definition of love. And I want to read it for us because I, I don't know that we understand love. The way that Jesus is commending the church at Thyatira for love, let's just see what that means. That means love is going to be patient. Okay, have you been patient all week? Hmm. Love is kind. Kind. It's not jealous. It does not brag. It's not arrogant. 
It does not act unbecomingly. Now, what does that mean? You know what that looks like. It does not seek its own way. It is not provoked. It does not take an account wrong suffered. Let me ask you this. Do you keep notes on when people do something against you? And whenever, you know, whenever they do something against you, you bring the notebook out and say, well, well let's look and see what you have done. And it does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but it rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. And the last verse in 1 Corinthians 13 says, But now faith, hope, and love abide these three. But the greatest of these is love. Love. When you go to the book of Galatians and, and Paul is talking about the Spirit's work in our life, contrasting the works of the flesh and the works of the Spirit, the first word found when he lists the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love. That is the defining mark of the believer. And Jesus looks at this church and said, you are a loving church. You're different than the church at Ephesus. They abandoned my love, their love for me, but you've held on to that. And not only are you a loving church, look what else he says. He says, I know that you're a faithful church. That's a Greek word that's very, very common. Most of the time when we see the word faith or belief, it's this Greek word. It just means that, that you're 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 holding on steadfast to the truth. You're dependable. You're trustworthy. And let me ask you, when you think about your life, when God looks at you, I wonder if God can look at you and say, you have been so faithful to me. You've been so faithful to use your talents. You've been so faithful to use your, your time. And you don't waste time doing these frivolous things. And, and you're serving. Because that's the next thing that we find here, that they were faithful, but they also served. The, the word there is where we get our word deacon from. It's de, not, uh, um, diakonos is the word that's used there. Servant. It's, it's a picture of someone who's humbled themselves and is willing to serve. Now think about this. In order to really love, you really serve. And who you serve shows who you love. So if you love some self, you love some you, and you make it all about you, but you become what? Selfish. And you serve who? Yourself. But whenever you're Christ-centered and others-centered, you're serving others. Listen, by our service, it demonstrates who we love. And so out of the love that we have for God and others comes service. But then listen, out of the faith, our faithfulness, there's that fourth term that's used. It's the word perseverance. Or, or steadfastness, consistency, that regardless of what's going on in the outside world, and that's what the Lord sees what's going on in Thyatira, as, as all of that sexual Im immorality is all around them, he says, I see that you're persevering through this. I see, see that you're holding on to the faith. And then there's that fifth description he gives of the church, and I love this one. Look at the end of verse number 19. That your deeds of late are greater than, than at first. Your deeds of late are greater than they were at first. So think about where you are in your, your service right now. Think about the work and how you're loving people and serving people. How you're faithful to God and faithful to the people around you. How you're persevering. Can you honestly say where I am right now in my faith, I'm way ahead of where I was previously. So God's asking us, is that where I'm at? Am I maturing in my faith? Am I growing in my faith? Or am I stagnant in my faith? And these are all great descriptions. I just look at what, what God looks and says about the church, and it's amazing. I wish it just stopped right there. That wouldn't be good if we, let's don't read anymore. We're fine. But then you get to verse number 20. And every time I read this phrase, it just, I don't know, there's something about it just, I just feel like the Lord is just, just, just looking at me and but I have this against you. I mean, all of us, when we read this, it should just cause us to kind of tighten up thinking, oh, my goodness. I mean, it's one thing for your grandma or your mother or your father to say, hey, I have this against you. 
It's like the Lord's pointing his finger and says, I have this against you. And look at this description. That you tolerate the woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and she teaches and leads my bond servants, my servants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat, eat things sacrificed to idols. You think about this just for a moment. Thyatira had a love that, that the church at Ephesus had abandoned. That they, had a, a, they had preserved the faith that was in jeopardy at the church at Pergamum. They had shared with Smyrna in the issue of perseverance. However, in the midst of all of these beautiful attributes, there was a cancer that was eating away at the church. Lounging seductively behind the facade of everything that looked good in the church was Jezebel. Jezebel in the Old Testament, she died about a thousand years before this was written. Jezebel was married to King Ahab who was a very wicked king. Jezebel was one who, who led King Ahab's heart away from God and, and, and really he was kind of there anyway. She just kind of pumped the, uh, fuel on the, on the fire. She actually built a temple uh, that was set up and there were 800 temple prostitutes that was in this temple. And Jezebel did all of this in the name of this is worship. And that just was bizarre. And Ahab never did anything. And then there was this prophet. Jezebel was, was, was so bad, there was this prophet Elijah that prophesied that she would die a sudden death and her body would be eaten by dogs. You see, Jezebel was the epitome of immorality and idolatry and here we have this teacher this woman that was within that church at Thyatira that had had taken and and just pulled people away from the from the Lord now here why, why did that how could that happen what why did the church just sit back and do nothing about it was it because they had a pure con a, a poor conscience that they, they just didn't feel like any remorse over what was going on, any con conviction, or was it they just had a weak courage? They just wasn't, wasn't willing to stand up. And notice that this modern Jezebel, she was called this prophetess. She had this reputation of teaching the Thyatirans. She deliberately led Christians into sexual immorality. She had them, um, encouraged them to violate their conscience regarding food sacrifice to, to idols. Jezebel encouraged those Christians to take what was in the world and bring it in the church, and all of a sudden, there it was. It was as if Jezebel was saying, if you can't beat them, join them. In the spirit of tolerance, let's just do like everybody else is doing. Man, what a warning here. I mean, just in the name itself. I'm sure if when you found out if you have children and you found out you were going to have a girl, I know Jezebel wasn't at the top of your list to name your child. <laughs> have have y'all ever met a Jezebel? I mean, not I mean that person named Jezebel, not a Jezebel. That's a whole other story. But the name Jezebel, never met one. Why would you name your child that name? Because of everything she stood for. Listen, we, we live in a sexually perverse society I was watching TV yesterday I was watching um, some football games and uh, some were better than others and I was watching some football games and uh, I'm just amazed at the commercials just I mean all the sexual innuendos um, it's in, in um, almost like every commercial and it's just like are you kidding me it's just how how pervasive it is in our society and church we must be careful I mean this this is serious stuff here because listen to, to 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 the warning in verse number 21 it was interesting we had our staff prayer time this morning and David Petro was the last one out of my office and he, he just looked at me he said you ready for this morning I said 
Man, this is a hard word today. I said, just listen to this. I read this passage to him. L listen to, to what the Lord says. I gave her time to repent, and she does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds. And I will kill her children with pestilence. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches. Here's that eye of flaming fire. I am he who searches the minds and hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. That's a strong word, church. It's a strong word. To, to, to think that, listen, our God is a very long-suffering God. He is so patient. I mean, he was patient with Jezebel here. He gave her, remember the word last week was repent. The word this week is repent. God gave her the opportunity to repent. And she chose not to. I mean, there's God just being so gracious and saying, I'm going to give you this opportunity. And she turned away. And, and he said, I'm going to give everybody an opportunity to repent of her deeds. And yet they were not willing to do so. Maybe you were here last week and you, maybe you just felt God was calling you to, to leave the, the chains that, that you've been bound by. And maybe for some of you it is sexual immorality. Maybe it is pornography. Maybe it is a, a relationship outside of your, your marriage. Maybe it's premarital sex that you're having. All of these things. Maybe last week you heard the Lord speaking to you, yep, but you were like Jezebel and you were not willing to relinquish and turn from that lifestyle of sin and turn to the Lord. But maybe the Lord, just one more time, how gracious our God is, one more time he's saying, look, I'm going to give you an opportunity. I'm going to give you an opportunity this morning to repent, to turn. He says, I'm going to cast her on a bed of sickness. And I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her way, ways. Listen to this. Literal punishment of sickness and death were going to be inflicted on her spiritual children in that cult family. That's what it was, a cult. You know, the sobering thing is, is that he looks past all of our facades and all of our masks this morning he sees who we are wow but it's not all bad he comes back to to the I call it the remnant within the church he comes back to those who are loving who are serving who are faithful who are persevering through the sickness of, of, of all this stuff going on those who were growing in their faith and notice what he says but I have this in verse 24 but I have this to say to the rest of who are in Thyatira, who, who do not hold this teaching and who do not know the deep things of Satan as they call them. Did you see there's occult worship happening here? Satan worship. I place no other burden on you. And, and look at this. I love this. Here's, the, here's the, the counsel he gives us. Verse number 26. Or verse 25, nevertheless, what you have done, hold fast. There's perseverance again. Hold fast until I come. He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces. He is here quoting Psalm 2, 7 through 9, where it is speaking of, how we will reign in the millennial kingdom with Christ. He said, if you just hold on, the end is in sight. If you just hold on, you're going to reign and you're going to rule with, with Christ. That's one promise. So here's the other promise, that, that you're going to be given the morning star. I believe he's speaking of Christ himself. Can you think of the great reward, church? If we persevere, if, if our deeds in now are greater than they were at first, and we love and we're faithful and we, and we trust Christ, Christ is going to be our, 
our inheritance, and we're going to also rule with Christ. Just hold on. Just hold on. So where does that leave us this morning? I think there are three things this morning I want you to, to leave with. And just quickly. Number one, I think most importantly, this letter reveals the seriousness. Listen to me. The seriousness of practicing and tolerating sin. See, it's one thing for us to, to, to practice it, but there's another thing so many of us tolerate it. Even as a church, we, we tolerate it. We don't hear a lot about church discipline anymore. And by the way, why is there church, church discipline? It's not because it's church judgment. It's called church reconciliation. It's called Christ's reconciliation. That we see someone who is caught in sin. We go to them in love and we confront them in love. And we want them to be restored. We want them to what? Repent. And turn back to the Lord. That's biblical. It's biblical. So please understand this morning that there is a seriousness when it comes to practicing and tolerating sin. But there's a second thing. The second thing that we see here is that there's a pattern of obedience that marks the believer. What is that pattern of obedience? Well, we read it. You're loving. You're faithful. You're serving. You're persevering. You're growing in your faith. All of those are marks of a believer. And then thirdly, God's gracious promise that we will inherit the Lord Jesus himself and we will reign with him. Three in incredible things that we need to learn this morning. So where does that leave us right now? Where does that leave us? You, you do realize that if you're just, as a child of God, if you're in open rebellion and you're involved in, in all this sexual immorality and the things that, that our culture is, you, you know what you're, you're doing? You're almost mocking the grace and mercy of the Lord. To, to think that he, here Christ would come and he would die and he would take, take on flesh, he would go to the cross and God himself on the cross and he would bear the judgment of your sin, bear the judgment of my sin, which is very serious. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As the Father turned his head on him, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus taking the penalty, taking my place on the cross, and then for me now to live and presume upon his grace and mercy. Why would you do that if you're a child of God? So let me just talk to you this morning. Maybe you've never given your life to Christ. Maybe you've never looked to, to Christ as the one who ultimately redeems. And maybe you're still trying to depend upon your goodness. And by the way, if you're honest and you look at your goodness, you can take all the goodness in this room and it's not good enough. Only Christ is good enough. Only Christ is the one who has the, the eye that can see who's all-knowing. Only Christ is the one who has the feet of bronze. He's all-powerful. And to know that he's here this morning and he wants relationship with you. That's his whole purpose, is he wants to be your God, number one in life.